he rudely pushed the same question. What Indians will you now contribute? Of this disregard, she signified her resentment by a disdainful aspect. Thomas Matthew, reporting on Queen Kakakoeski's meeting with the Virginia Governor's Council, 1676. In this episode, entitled No Obey, we're going to look at five women who prove that well-behaved women don't make Jamestown history. In September 1608, a ship called the Mary and Margaret docked at Jamestown. The ship was part of the so-called Second Supply to Virginia, full of much-needed supplies and dozens of new settlers. Among these were two women, a Mrs. Thomas Forrest and her teenage maidservant, Ann Burris. They were the first two English women in Jamestown. We hear nothing else about Mrs. Forrest, so it is presumed she quickly died. That would have left the maidservant, Anne, free to marry. But it also left her, aged 14, the only English woman in Virginia, surrounded by hundreds of men. Anne quickly married the carpenter, John Layden, the first English marriage at Jamestown, and the first marriage at the newly built church at Jamestown. Anne and John seemed to have a successful marriage, raising four daughters into adulthood, and they must have been made of tough stuff to have, along with their first child, survived the 169-10 starving time, although Jamestown itself barely survived the starving time, a period of draconian martial law meant to discipline the colonists soon followed. During this period, Anne Burris Layden made shirts for the colony using materials from the common store. Anne and another seamstress, Joan Wright, were accused of stealing from the company. Their theft was in actuality a crime of ingenuity, as Anne and Joan had shirt shifted, using thread from the bottom of other shirts to finish her total number of shirts for the company after running out of thread. The two women were whipped and Anne miscarried. But she was a survivor, having more children, living into her 40s, and by the 1630s, she had her ultimate revenge as her family survived and she controlled over 1,200 acres of land. We turn our attention to another historical figure that would not be held back. Although she did not come to America, Queen Jenga is important to Jamestown for her connection to Angela and the other first Africans brought to Virginia in 1619. They mostly originated from the Kingdom of Dongo, it was now modern-day Angola. Jinga, whose name in Kimbundu means twist, or someone who in essence is prophesied to grow up proud, was raised in the royal household of Dongo, which by 1619 was embroiled in warfare with both the Portuguese and African Mbagala mercenaries. Jinga's brother, who had succeeded her father as king, was jealous of his sister's political skill and education, he had Jenga's son put to death and forced Jenga to become sterile out of fear of her power and succession. Yet after he lost the capital of Dongo and failed to hold off the Portuguese in the war that ultimately brought the captive Africans obliquely to Virginia, he summoned his sister back to court. Jenga could read and write in Portuguese and was a skilled diplomat. In 1622, Jinga met with the Portuguese governor, who refused to offer her a seat, as to him it would be a symbol of their equality. Jinga recognized the insult and told her maidservant to go down on her hands and knees to become like a chair. Jinga sat on the maidservant so she could speak eye to eye with the Portuguese governor, and then they negotiated a deal, a treaty which the Portuguese failed to honor. By 1624, Jinga, who had converted to Catholicism with the name Ana de Sousa, became the new ruler of Dongo. As many of her rivals refused to acknowledge a female ruler, she dressed and lived essentially as a man and led troops into battle personally. Her many husbands were forced to dress as women to become, in a way, Jinga's wives. Jinga held on to Dongo and ruled neighboring Matamba for several decades fighting off the Portuguese and making a successful alliance with the Dutch. She turned her kingdom also into a refuge for runaway slaves and died 
unconquered, at the age of 82. She is today considered the mother of Angola. So far we've seen women as rulers and servants, but in the case of Cicely Jordan Farrar, we have a middle-class English Virginian who also behaved in quite an unorthodox fashion. Cicely arrived in Virginia in 1610 on the ship Swan, soon after the starving time when she was little more than 10 years old. She first married John Bailey as a teenager and had a daughter named Temperance in 1618. Her first husband died soon after. The widow soon married prominent planter Samuel Jordan of Jordan's Journey, which is in modern-day Prince George County, Virginia, by 1620. Two more daughters followed. They survived the 1622 Powhatan Uprising, and their homestead became a rallying point for the English in the hard-hit upper portion of the James River. The Jordans' marriage was an unhappy one, apparently, with Samuel being accused of being in love with a neighboring woman. Nevertheless, for Cicely, she seemed to have her problem solved when Samuel died in 1623. Or so she thought. John Farrar was a man whose homestead was destroyed in the uprising in 1622. He then moved to the Jordan's Journey neighborhood and decided to help Cicely settle her affairs. At nearly the same time, a reverend named Grivel Pooley claimed that about three to four days after Samuel Jordan's death, he and Cicely had toasted a marriage proposal even though she was currently pregnant and her late husband had been recently buried. But Reverend Pooley claimed they were keeping the engagement secret. A controversy soon erupted when Farrar and Cicely moved in together without being married, which was then both scandalous and illegal. Reverend Pooley sued Cicely and the matter went to general court. Witnesses were called, some of whom were local gossips full of juicy details, including one eyewitness who said he saw Farrar and Cicely kissing in public. The flabbergasted Virginia court referred the matter across the ocean to England. The English jurists told the Virginia courts to do nothing. The case was dropped, and soon after, Cicely married Farrar, and presumably, and finally, lived happily ever after. And all of this by the time she was 24 years old. Cicely Jordan was part of a generation of English women who survived the Powhatan Uprising of 1622, which killed many of the colonists on a single day. Yet the Powhatan tribes were themselves retaliating from English incursions into their lands, violence, and broken promises. Another uprising occurred in 1644, and like the previous attack, led to war and English reprisals. By the 1650s, the Pamunkey tribe, newly allied with the English, from which the Powhatan paramount chieftain's leadership originated, were led by Tadapotomy. His life was cut short while eating the English Colonel Hill, on the colony's frontier. Colonel Hill was blamed for the debacle and was censured. The Jamestown government then recognized his wife, Kakakoeski, as the new queen of the Pamunkey. By 1676, the Pamunkey continued to honor their agreement with the English by providing warriors to help the colonists defend against their mutual enemies, the Susquehanna. Unfortunately for the Pamunkey and other Powhatan peoples, the poor colonial decisions made on the frontier exposed a leadership crisis and a lack of confidence in long-term Governor William Barclay's rule. When Kakakoeski was summoned to Jamestown and her warriors were demanded from her, Kakakoeski said to the Jamestown government that all she could provide was 12 rather than the usual 100 or so. Kakakoeski saw trouble brewing amongst the English, and the English were soon dissolved into a civil war when Nathaniel Bacon led a rebellion against Barclay and led an army not only to overthrow him and the Jamestown government, but to kill any Indian and ransack any village that got in his way, whether friendly to the English or not. Kakakoeski successfully led her people to the Pagan Swamp to avoid Bacon's army. Her quick thinking saved hundreds of lives. In 1677, when the rebellion was finally crushed, English royal officials recognized the series of errors, incompetent decisions, and bad faith with the Virginia Indians was all to blame for the crisis. 
On May 29, 1677, the Treaty of Middle Plantation was signed, whereby the Pamunkey became a vassal state of England and could call on that nation for its official protection. It is the basis of the tribe's rights to this day, and led to the first reservation in Virginia. Kakakoweski received a frontlet, which had both Pamunkey and English symbols on it. This frontlet has been recently repatriated to the tribe a few years ago. Kakakoweski died in 1686. The town of Middle Plantation, where the treaty between the Pamunkey and the English crown was signed, became Williamsburg in 1699. It had replaced Jamestown as Virginia's capital. Six years earlier, the colony's first college, William & Mary, was established. That college would be headed by the Reverend James Blair, who immigrated to Virginia in 1685 to re-establish and reform the English church in the colony. Blair was a well-educated and well-connected member of society and easily ingratiated himself into the Virginia gentry, including the powerful Harrison family. A marriage was proposed between the middle-aged Reverend Blair and the Harrison's teenage daughter, Sarah, in the late spring of 1687. The problem was, Sarah had already agreed to a marriage contract with a certain William Roscoe that April. But anyhow, on June 2nd, Sarah and James were married. That wasn't the only scandal. During their wedding service, it was said that when Sarah was asked to recite the phrase, Obey. During her wedding vows, she loudly said, No, obey. The Reverend repeated. She then said, No, obey again. The Reverend repeated a third time, and a third time, Sarah, the proud 17 year old, said, No, obey. James Blair nodded, and the rest of the wedding vows proceeded. But by most accounts, the marriage may have been unhappy. It was also childless. Sarah Blair died in 1713 and was buried at Jamestown. A tree later grew between Sarah and James's tombstones, leading to many legends, including the famous mother-in-law tree story that was told by caretaker Sam Robinson at Jamestown during the 1930s to 1950s. But in any case, Sarah Harrison, like the other women in this story, did not obey. And that is why we know about them. And as this video was produced right before Mother's Day, I want to take this time to wish a happy Mother's Day to my mother Gloria, my mother-in-law Liz, and most especially to my lovely wife Susan, who helped me in the research for this video. And to all the mothers out there, thank you and have a wonderful holiday. Bye-bye.